and today we're going to be talking about estimating and bidding. So there are a couple of questions that we use to form this topic. So Jose, let's talk about them. So the question is, are you anxious uh, about talking about money with your clients? Do you get anxious about that? Do you underbid a job and then later on feel anger and some sense of resentment? I've done that. Um, You've done that? Yeah, of course. Oh, oh, you, come on, <laughs> you have to be a designer. Uh, three, bidding projects and thinking uh, that you're profitable, but you really aren't. That's a good one. I'm good at that one, too. I've That's a good that one. one. We, we all are guilty of that. Yeah, you think totally you're making money, but you're not really like making money. the money, and it's actually, we're losing money. Do you lack the confidence to ask for more money? Meaning, you think you're worth more, but something inside of you is just timid, and you're not ready yeah. to ask for it. You under-ask. And you under-ask. The, the two most important ones here in this topic today of estimation is, are you getting torn apart by cost consultants? And... How do you value, do value-based pricing? Actually, those are advanced. Those are for those of you who are like, you know, Master Doe, you're, uh, you're in a studio or in an agency, you know. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Wait, what was that? I don't that know. That was the Master <laughs> Doe intro. That actually, actually should be the intro to our right. show. Bong. Bong. All right. We should have a gong. Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about estimation. Hey, bring up the title card that says estimation again, just because it's so cool. Like title card. There we go. Oh, yes, yeah, like beautiful. Magic. We're professional. We're pro. Like, we have a studio. Fist bump, boom. Nobody's had a fist bump. All right, this is again. Double right, fist bump. All right. All right. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. What are we talking about? Anxious. Anxious. Why are people anxious about talking about money? I don't know. Well, we did an episode on confidence. There's a link below. <laughs> Watch that. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's all you got to do. Um, well, I mean, how, why have you been anxious about talking about money with a client? I think it's cultural to bring up money and then wrap that within the layer of being a designer or an artist. And talking about money and art, I think it, it makes you feel like you're selling out or that the two conversations should not mix. That's fair. But you're gonna hurt yourself if you're a freelancer, a solopreneur, or an agency owner if you're not comfortable talking about money. So I, I think the way to talk about money is just like anything else, it's like breathing. Well, but there's also the, the Remove designer. the emotion out well, of it, right? No, listen, no? Okay. listen, 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 hey, listen. Don't Linda. tell me to listen. Listen. Would you call me Linda? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it, Nicole says what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. If you know what I'm talking about, you can make a comment. Um, it's a, it's a Dub. video. Ah, Go. all right. Focus. Focus. Yeah. Focus. Um, the point is that if you don't want to talk about money, that you can also use a proxy. That if you're, because some of us are more artists, you know, we don't want to necessarily have to get, you okay. know, you know, what do you mean proxy? Uh, have somebody with you that's helping you on the negotiation. That's what I did. So like the final conversation about numbers, somebody else did. I would ask the question, is it, you know, $10,000 or is it 100? You know, like that's the magnitude of scale question and they would give us a, oh, our budget's a little bit in between that. And great, okay, cool. Now I take that information back with me to the studio and somebody else puts the estimate together. So you're saying by proxy, you mean the part that you're not comfortable doing, have somebody else do it for you? Yeah, it's like Serrano the Verjek in the novel. He uh, had somebody, uh, he was... He was um, ugly. Yeah. He wasn't handsome, so he so was... So, right, if you're not confident... So you're saying because you're ugly, you need to do somebody else? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about looks. I'm just talking about confidence. If you're not confident enough to do it, have somebody help you. That's all. That's one option. I don't like that option. Okay. Because Fine. what I've been through with my coach is to... Whatever it is that you're not good at, that's holding you back from achieving. Jump into it. Jump into it face first. Face your fears. Learn how to do it. I don't disagree with that. Okay. I don't disagree with that. But my experience is that the minute that I pass the threshold from small projects, like I can actually totally bid on a twenty-five thousand dollar project and on a no fifty thousand dollar project, a hundred. My confidence level at two fifty five hundred. I'm like, you. am I worth that? I hear so you. I had somebody help me with that today. I like that. And you, thanks for being so honest about right. that. Right. So. Even today, it's kind of challenging. What's interesting, and I'll end at that, and we should move on to the next one, um, is that um, I'm actually helping uh, some of those same people now, mm -hmm. helping them do what they help me do, which is, no, dude, you should charge more. Right. So, so it's the always funny, easier for somebody else. You're right. It's easier to prescribe the answer yeah. than to actually do yeah, it. Actually, so yeah. that's the thing that I think you should embrace that, listen to your own advice, and try to do it yourself. And I think that's to remove the emotional part that we attach with money out. Okay, so that's a big I'm part. I'm worth it. I'm worth it. And it's a game for me to play. Not all of us are robots. Okay. But Some of us have more emotions than you do. Right. But I've, you can be I've destroyed my emotions. Right. You can be pretty unemotional, but I can totally tell 
tell you that my emotions go like, Woo, woo. Okay, but before we move on, though, what if you don't have a big support, supporting staff and you have to be able and to do it? you're all by it? yourself? Yeah, because I think some of our audience uh, are in that same position. You got to be able to talk about money and you got to be able to talk about a Write rational it on paper, way. Put it in an email. They're like a, like a used loud. car salesman, yeah, like, here's like, the price. Here's the price. Yeah. And then they look at it and they laugh. <laughs> no, no. You yeah. see, now you're making fun of them. Now they're going to be nervous even more so. But let's talk about the mechanics of it because if you're confident in what you're estimating, it'll be easier to talk about it. So that's remove the emotions. That's okay. the number one part. Now, okay. if you know what you're doing, so the question number two is people want to know are they underbidding? You know, or are, am I bidding it right? The reason, oh, this question came from somebody online. Who's that? During the sales uh, episode, multiple people have asked this question, uh, but one of the questions was asked in this way. Hi, Jose. Hi, Chris. Uh, this is from Benji Inclino uh, about six days ago uh, on the sales episode. Would love to see an episode about uh, contracts and estimation, the process you guys go through from the moment you draft it to the moment your client signs. This is more about contracts. Great. Somebody else asked, can you do an episode about estimation? So we're they're related. They're related. They're related. We're asking that. We're not going to go into contracts today, but this is the first part. Okay. So, do you underbid? How do you know you're underbidding or not? Well, you have a nice system to do it. Yeah. So, I, I think first, to just to kind of give some uh, context to that, when you think you're underbidding, it's because you're working on a project for a really long time, and maybe you've entered into what what industry people call scope creep. Yeah. And it's gone beyond. So somewhere along the way, it was a slippery slope. You agreed to do a few changes. Two changes turned into 17 changes, and now you're feeling like you're upside down on this job. Mm -hmm. So something that should have been profitable at five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 is now becoming not profitable to you. Yep. And you start to become angry, and you start to resent the client. And yeah. sometimes that spills over. So the problem happened way before you actually took on the job. Oh, yeah. It happened right? at, the, at the estimation phase. Right. It happened in the estimation phase. Yep. And so... Let's talk about that a little bit. So I've got some, some points to talk about. Maybe this is a good opportunity to bring those up, those four questions. Guys, can you pull up that slide? Here you go. So here we go. So when I'm talking to a client, I'm doing a little kind of thinking about what I need to determine before I even put an estimate together. Because as you guys know, putting an estimate together requires a lot of time and a lot of thought, and it's using your experience. So I'm going to go down the list here. One, does a client's concept line up with their budget? Now, they'll talk about ideas about doing a multi-day shoot, about incorporating graphics and CG animation they want to do in a photo real thing. So what I like to do is talk to them about the money right away to do a reality check. Say, great, I love your ideas. They're big, they're ambitious, it's cinematic. You know, ref uh, recite or say back to them what you heard, right? And then they're going to get excited about that and say, but in my experience, that's a $200,000 concept. Now, we can do it for a little less than that, but it's not going to be a $10,000 concept. Right. So then you're going to get a reaction from them. And they could say, whoa, 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 whoa. We were just dreaming pie in the sky. We had no idea. So you can provide value right then and there. And it's, uh, there's a term in... in, in what magnitude of scale. Magnitude of scale. Yeah. Is that the term? You're, yeah, yeah. You're, okay. you're testing the magnitude of scale. Is it $5 or is it $10? Right. Uh, for architects and contractors, they call it value engineering meaning we can change some materials, deliver the look of the design, but for a lot less. So that's one thing. Does the budget match the concept? Number two, do you want to work with them? Now, you may have... You like the people. You, have, you do like them. Do you guys get along? Do you like their company, their ethos, their philosophy? Are they a, a conscious um, uh, business, business yeah. right? Um, you may have a conflict of interest. They're a shoe company, and you have a big shoe company, and you want to keep. Those are the kinds of things you need to figure out. Point number three. Yep. Are you the third bid? And you guys may not even be aware of this. The third bid means you're the obligatory th third bid oh, because the client they're requires. They're using you. They're using you. The client requires three bids in order to determine if it's I've a fair. I've won contracts when I'm the third bid, but that's a real hard. That's a real hard battle. It's a hard battle. It's yeah. a long shot. I wouldn't try it. Right. That's a like hail mary pass. Sometimes you get it. But how do you ask that. even? Hey, I, I, I just ask, bid? and I'll tell you how I ask. Okay, oh. pretend you're the client. Hi, uh, yeah, hey, Chris, we want you to do this project. You guys would be awesome for it. Thank you so much for inviting us to this. We'd be really excited to work on this. But I have to just ask you, because we're a relatively small company, and it takes us a lot of time to put an estimate and bid together. If you just need numbers from us because your clients require a third estimate, we'd be more than happy to do it. Tell us what number that ne needs to be, and we'll, we'll submit it. Damn. Is that okay? Damn. That is masterful right there. Thank you. If you're lying, just tell us. We'll help you lie. What's the fourth thing? Is there even a fourth point, or is that it? No, that was it. Oh, no, no. The fourth thing is sometimes because it's a relationship or an account that you really want to have, 
you may be willing to make certain concessions. For example, when I was first moving into doing strategic um, work, yeah. strategic work, doing strategy, I, I kind of had to do a lot more work than what I can charge for. I needed a case right. study and I needed to build up my own confidence. So that was an investment in our firm and practice. The, the one danger and the caveat I want to throw out there is don't get into a trap of doing that. Like, doing not over, every over, single over, client right, right, right. is an opportunity. Well, no, no, keep in mind that, that that's actually, you do that, it's called, uh, uh, it's called uh, uh, priming the pump. You're like beginning to do something, you're really establishing the reputation, you don't have to do that forever. And you can incrementally increase price as you go through. I mean, keep in mind, something that I've said many times is that estimating and pricing, it is totally relative and subjective. It's relative to the size of the company. It's relative to uh, your company's positioning. Are you premium or are you the cheaper? It's relative to are you one dude in your, you know, in your, in your, in your bedroom, you know, calling yourself a web design shop, or do you have ten people in your office? You know, you have to cover the the, the overhead, right? The monthly nut. The monthly nut. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really kind of uh, nuances to the estimation. Uh, my philosophical framework from the beginning, when I started my my practice uh, back in 2001, is I always behaved like a big agency, even if I was all by myself in my loft. You know, I even I even structured the business model to do that. So back to the the the, the getting back on track to our cards. Um, we were at do you underbid? This is this is your framework on how to bid. Uh, bidding projects. The the third one is uh, bidding a project. Do you think you're profitable, but you're really not? So that's an issue of how to calculate that into your bid. So I wanted to show you guys how I do it or I'm gonna give you a budget spreadsheet or worksheet, and here's what it looks like. The first estimate, two, is this first slide, um, is that, okay, so here are the type of estimates that you're gonna be asked to do. <laughs> okay, what are you, laughing? That's there, the that's, slide. Slide. that's the right well, slide, thanks Actually, guys. let's go back to the other one. Let's you wanna go, go back, back to the other one, because he screwed yeah. up? All right. No, because I screwed up, but before I even go into estimation, what type of estimations are there, dude? Yeah, let's, let's break it. it down. Let's break it down. So type of estimates, project-based. All right, we can come back to us. What's a project-based estimate? A project-based estimate usually is a, a firm bid. It's a mm -hmm. fixed fee for the scope of the project. That's yeah. all it is. And it's, is that, is that right? Yeah. Hey, okay. Chris, I'm not sure. yeah, uh, it's like you're like, please design this cup for us. Give us the price for just the design of the cup. Right. That's it. Right. You right. know exactly what you're doing. Right. And you okay. need to get all the parameters. You need to figure all that stuff out. Okay. okay. So that's fixed fee, meaning that in the contract, you have one price. It's your responsibility to do all the work that you agreed to under that price. You can't change your mind. You could do change requests or change orders, but that needs to be in the contract. That's another episode. All right. Generally Second. speaking, unless the clients do something differently, you cannot ask for a change order because you've estimated poorly. Because you, it's, you're the one who's It's a fixed up. fee, yeah. So let's go to the next, the same slide again. So hourly is the other one. So hourly is a way that you calculate it. So you can actually do a contract that says you're going to pay us this much an hour, X an hour, and uh, you just request how many hours you want per week or something like that. Like sure. a freelancer can do this. Right. Like, That's a freelancer kind yeah. of model. Yeah. And they can right. do high lows. I can say, look, I've done that. Do, do 10 hours a week at $100 an hour. What, it, what normally we say is here's our hourly or day rate mm -hmm. and you want to book us for four days, I'll mm -hmm. do the work for four days at X dollars a day. That's it. So that's, that's kind of like base on hourly with, a, with a, a cap. That's called hourly with a cap. That's actually a really good one. That's a very good technique. Clients love that because they can quantify it. They can count it. All right. So the next one is cost, time, and materials. Cost plus is what Chris calls it. I call it time and materials, which is it's going to be uh, 10 hours, which is $1,000 at 100 plus. Materials is going to be buying the domain or paper or this and that. It'll be a, 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 whatever the, invo uh, we estimate about $200 worth of materials. What it really means, and it's an industry term, cost plus really means what it costs us plus a markup. And so oh, it's cost it's plus 30% markup. 20% markup, something like that. Cost plus is a different thing for you then. And, right. That shouldn't even be in the same line. Well, no, it is similar because okay. we establish a, a rate for each person that's working on the project, an hourly fee. Editors use this a lot, or they used to do this, 
and then anything else that goes, so the clients who might want six days of editing, and they've only estimated for three, then they know what they're in for, because the, all the rates are there, and right. then there's a markup to Cost cover Cost plus overhead. whatever extra, got it. Right, and that is a great way to, to estimate if you, if you are a fan of hourly-based pricing, which I'm not personally, mm -hmm. but that covers you in case it bleeds and you get into project uh, scope creep, Yeah. right? And that will prevent you from getting into a situation where you wind up presenting the, uh, the situation yeah. and the client later on. So that goes back Cost to plus. two. So Boom. then the, the final two, let's go through those really quickly and then we can add. So there's value-based pricing, which is something that Chris really likes and he just mentioned do. he didn't like hourly, based on the client upside, how much the client is going to make from you. And then the other one is percentage of revenue when you might be negotiating a revenue split with your client if it's an e-commerce or if it's an affiliate. There's a lot of ways of doing that. So those are the different ways. So let me just break down the next thing, which is going to be Wait, 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 wait. You can't just cover oh, it like just, that. Just you just those. jumped over like, boom, thing. forget about cost plus. And yeah, we spend a lot of time on cost plus and hourly. Value-based pricing, Jose. What All is right. that? What's value-based pricing? What are the different ways you can determine that? Well, value-based pricing is really tricky because you have to know what the value is of what you're doing to the right. client. So that means what are you doing for you the really client? have to get into the business and the weeds of the, of the business. So, But an example is if you're doing consulting and you know that the client is going to benefit from what you're doing for them at X rate. I'll give you an example. If you're doing an information website to help your clients recruit uh, better candidates, so that means that the client tells you, we're having a challenge where we're paying a recruiter to hire people, but the people we're getting aren't great or something like that. I'm making this completely up as a scenario. And the challenge is that the people don't understand our culture sufficiently and the people that we're attracting don't think that we're, uh, that we don't attract high enough quality people. So what you decide is that you're gonna build a better looking website and you're gonna do some strategy for your company and some positioning so that you look better and you can recruit better people. Then I go to the client and I say, okay, Mr. Client, or you're gonna Mr. Client, okay, Mr. Client. Yes. Uh, you want us to do the website for you. How much is it costing you today to uh, recruit an executive at your company? Like how much you pay a recruiter? Probably 20% uh, above their salary. Okay, so if the person's $200,000, you're paying 40K. 20, 40K. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna charge you $40,000 for your website. Is that worth it? to get that So for the executive. price of one executive, I'm yeah. gonna be able to recruit a lot more, website, yeah. so there's a tremendous Penix, upside. Yeah. That sounds pretty reasonable Is that to me. reasonable? Yeah. Great. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. So you might have walked in to sell a $10,000 website, and you didn't really know what it was worth to that client. And you can say, well, they're a small company. No, the only way that you can calculate a company, when you look at a company and you're dressing them up and down, you look at how many employees they have. If they have an office... Are you, did you say undressing them up and down? No, I said dressing them up and down. It's a term to signify you're looking them up and down. Okay. Get it? No. Don't undress your clients. And Okay, moving on. You calculate... Hold on, hold on. And we, we have a question. We have a question, okay. Oh, $150,000 times the number of employees. If they have 10 employees, 200 to make it even. They make $2 million a year. Or that's how much they should make. 1.5 to 2. Here's the question. That's a good question. And I'm okay, like, let's repeat it. So we can what are the ranges? Nicole, thanks for, uh, for bringing up that question from, from Dr. Dr. Bullock Bullock. The question is... Bullock Bullock. Bullock Bullock. That's a good name. The question is, how much, what are the ranges for shops? How much, what is the hourly use? Let's, let's, let's figure out what position is because I have a lot of different rates depending on who's working on it. So there's variable rates relative to the type of person. The budget that I'm going to show you has a little bit of both. But I always estimate it based on a, very, on a blended rate. Blended rate means the high and the low averaged is $150. Safe. 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 Pretty safe. Pretty safe. Right. So that's a blended rate that is pretty industry standard. But you see shops charge 75 Listen, the minute that you are a shop, you better be charging above. If you're in the U.S., you better be charging above $75 an hour. If you're not, you're going to get the, mm, that's not a legitimate shop kind of thing. Um, $100 an low. hour is reasonable to charge. If you're one person in your bedroom saying you're a shop, you can still charge $100 an hour if you're offering you know, the quality service. Yeah. yeah. For uh, strategy, for I'd like to charge $1,000 an hour. I know that yeah. sounds like a lot, but it's no, a tremendous value. No, that's not a lot, yet. actually. That's not a lot at all. Yeah. Um, so here's the challenge, Dr. Balik Balik. Um, Balik Balik. Tune in today, uh, to today's episode. Uh, What's your challenge? Oh, we're not, we're, we're, the, the challenge is... Uh, that you have to justify the rate relative to your positioning 
and relative to how you're perceived. If you are a freelancer, I would not pay you more than 65 to $75 an hour. If you're a shop and I'm hiring you as a shop, paying you $75 an hour would be weird. Does that make sense? Yes. I would say it's twice because the resource cost is 75. Okay. That's it. Bolick. Oh, Bolick. What were we saying? Bolick. <laughs> you said Bolick first. <laughs> you bollock. you queued us up, man. I you can't bollock. read it. I said Bolick, Bolick. Okay. It doesn't. Sorry, Dr. Bolick. Okay. Are you a real doctor? Bolick. He's in Bolick. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> um, we were talking about how to do value-based pricing, which I'm a big fan of. So Jose talked about looking at it the upside, like what value you're generating for the for company the yeah. but let's look at like this if you're going to design an identity system you know for the most part whatever you do the amount of work you're going to put in is going to be the same for a one person mom you know like one person operation to a multi-million dollar national company right multi you mean that you're going to charge them the same no 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 that the amount of work is relatively it's similar. relatively the same so but, but you can charge them very different prices right if right. i can finish yeah thank you okay. thank you um so that makes sense to everybody, right? So you're not going to charge, even for the same amount of work, one price across different sectors and different sizes of companies. So as I mentioned this, you can look at the number of employees and do a little math. Your formula is 200K times every employee. Mm -hmm. If they have 10 employees, they should be grossing or generating that revenue in the $2 million range. Is my yep. math okay? Yep. Okay. Yep. So that's how you look at the size of the company and determine their gross. The other way you can look at this is bigger companies need assurance that you're not going to screw it up, that you've done the due diligence, that you've done research. So a smaller operation charging less, believe it or not, will not get the job. Charging more for a bigger company gives them assurance that they've hired the right people. Because think about it from their point of view. More often than not, they just want to make sure they've hired the right partner to, to do uh, the identity design yeah. for them. Assurance. 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 That yeah. you won't screw it up, that you've done the proper homework, that you have the right pedigree and the right body of work. Yeah. They pay for that, even if the work isn't as exciting as the smaller firm. Totally. Actually, the majority of the time, the bigger the agency, the less exciting the work is, the smaller, the more innovative, but that also scares people. So It's risky. It's risky. So talking about four, do you lack the confidence to ask for more? Do you lack the confidence to ask for more money? Talk Call to now. Dr. Tom Boo. Wait, no, wait. No, okay. now you're no, 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 no. He's right. not even a doctor. He's not even a doctor. It's Tuan, not even Tom. All right, so let's bring up my slide. But the reason why I want to show this in, as it relates to the confidence is this. This one right here. So what I'm showing you is, if those of you that uh, were on our webinar the other day for Veris Wealth Partners, a case study, this is the real budget. And um, what is this Excel or is this Keynote? No, this is Keynote. I Impressive. make very pretty budgets. There's a link below where you can actually download it. We're going to give it to you. Christo is going to be upset that I'm giving it away for free, but I'm giving it away for free. I'm not going to be upset. Oh, you're not upset? It's your okay. estimate. All right. So, so here's what you, I want you guys to notice. Um, look at the columns uh, uh, or the, the column at the top where I have the role of the resource, the name of the resource, what estimated hours they have, the rate that we told the client. And I could have put 150 in there to just blend it. Uh, and the actual cost that it's costing me is on the right. Keep in mind, uh, an MBA or a mathematician didn't do the spreadsheet. I did it. And I actually did the, 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 the formulas in it. And, and I'm pretty, pretty, pretty slow when it comes to this stuff. But I can use pages. This is, Focus. A, this is Apple Pages. So billable to client is the total of hours that were estimated as it relates to the resource cost. So the estimated cost of sale is a different price. So if you look at the IA in this one, uh, it says 4,950 billable to client, but the estimated cost of sale is 2,000. That's with the profit margin uh, built in. So what you'll see at the bottom, you'll see the, the in SOW is the price that we're charging the client, actual cost of sales. And down here at the bottom right in the dark, uh, it says incoming, how much is outgoing, and what my gross profit is. That's what I want to calculate. Hold on. This is not an estimate. Wait, wait, let, let me, okay, I'll, get, I'll call you no, in a second. No, this is my calculation worksheet. You have another question. This yeah, is yeah, this is an internal worksheet. thing, yeah. not an external. Right. You're not supposed to show them I don't show your this internal client. costs. No, right. No. But you can use this formula right here. You can see it, it's pretty obvious. If the internal cost is costing you $112 an hour, you need to double that. So you just put a simple, what is that called, uh, uh, expression or not a, a, a formula. formula? A formula in there to double that. And that's what your clients are going to see. And as you're doing your job, a, a project manager or producer is going to track the number of actual hours versus the estimated to see if you're over or under every category. If you're doing really well, you should come in a little bit under every single category. Correct. 
right? Correct. Now, I hate this kind of estimate, but let's... Why? Tell me why. Well, Tell me why. if you supply this to the client and you have their rates and the hours you send to the client, they're going to sit there and watch the hours that you work on it. There is no upside to this except for the only downside is, wait a minute, we never saw the, uh, the interaction designer, inter what is that called? Uh, what is it? The IA? What is IA? What is the information heck? architect. The information architect. We never saw the information architect. We want that money back. But in the meantime, you spent 60 hours on, uh, what is that person, the project manager? Well, keep in mind two You know things. what I'm saying? Well, keep in so mind that, that's where they can these get These are in. real roles and responsibilities, yeah. and these are real people that are going to be on the project. Yeah. Or, or a role that's going to be played on the project. So four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. What's the Great. We have two questions. Ask but wait, questions. I, I need to finish this part, and then we can take the two questions. Perfect break. So here's how I'd like to do it instead. So what is the sum total of your estimate here? I can't read it. 31, yeah, 31K, $32,000. The way I like to do this is just go straight to the, can we bring up the laws of contrast, guys? That slide? I'd like to do it this way, guys. Let me show you a different way to estimate. Laws of contrast say, says this. Um, when you look at two numbers, yeah. one number looks smaller, one number looks a lot bigger, right? Yeah. So what I like to do is do a soft close and throw out numbers with the client the very first meeting, if possible, once you understand the scope of work. To say, like, you know what, for a website like this, I'm thinking it's somewhere between thirty dollars to $75,000 given the projects we've built in the past. Great. Where are you guys in that budget range? Let's just have a real honest conversation about it. It doesn't do us any good. It's a waste of time if I go and build you an estimate that you can't afford, right? Right. So they'll say, right. We're probably somewhere in the middle. So I said between 30 to 75, right? So right. let's say now they come back. So if I come back to you with an estimate of about $55,000, you guys are going to be okay. I'm going to go work on that estimate, okay? Now, instead of getting the $32,000 I was going to ask for, now I've got a $55,000 project, and I've just made an additional $20,000 in pure income. I got that. Hold on. Then I'll go back to my producer, my project manager, and say, based on the project we got approved by the client, you are allowed to spend X percentage of that budget. You get it done. You manage the resources. I don't care. Hey, Top line. Listen, that's a great 20th century system, old man. But the issue is that the 21st century A is far more don't transparent and far more uh, uh, variable. And, and I'll explain that why, but let's ask okay. the question. Okay. So we can check out bank accounts later to see which way it's working. Well, no, don't be cocky uh, now because that's, uh, <laughs> I've, I've made a lot of money and you've made a lot of money yeah, and right. it has nothing to do with whose bank account is where at which time. Well, you just... But, so you're competitive. You're offended by what I said. No, because you, you calculated mine as the wrong poor way no, to do it. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying is that 21st century projects are much more complex than what you are basing that system that you used on simpler projects. Perhaps. With an agency as a client. Okay, okay. Totally different. Right, we'll, we'll debate it. The minute two, the two that questions. you get into a, a corporate executive, and I'm doing this right now. Okay. I'm negotiating contracts with a large corporation, and they want to know the value of the hours relative to the value of the output. They want you to give them the entire... I won't do it. It's a consulting business model. I won't do then it. Then you can't sell a project to the big clients, to the big boys. Two questions. Okay, question. You have two questions. Two questions. Yes. So Great question. So there's materials. Hold on, hold on. You, you have to reread it. Okay, hold on. Should anything else be covered? Nicholas Marks. Nicholas Marks, thank you for the asked, question. Should anything else be covered in the estimate? Besides the, the time, time and, and material. the materials. Yes. Price and the time difference. What else should be covered in the estimate, Jose? Should uh, I I don't do like, you know, how much, you know, the materials and food and meals are gonna cost per se, because we build that into the cost of sale. I okay. don't do that. What you need to include in your estimate is what you're actually going to deliver. What's the work product? I like to focus on that. I also like to focus on the process, meaning uh, we're going to show you two frames or ten frames and do two rounds of edits so that I can define the nature of the work. Otherwise, it can be a runaway train. That's a good point. And there's also the issue of the type of estimates that you do. In, in, consult in, the, in the discussion we're having uh, about when I, when I called Chris Old Man and he got offended and defensive, um, is the idea that in the uh, SOW or in the statement of work, you put what you're delivering, which answers your question. Uh, you can, if you want, put materials, or you can put that, and that's something that is not uncommon in print projects, especially. Right. Um, 
in a consultative base selling, meaning as a consulting firm, you're basically, you could put materials, but the majority of it is really being the brain power, right? in the rate, in the rate, the brain power. Right. You know, you don't right. want to, meals yeah. is not. We have two more minutes. Okay, go for the second question. Uh, the, the actual, the comment was, it would be great that we're all videos doing just contracts. Um, yes. So yeah. Have a or so our next episode we'll do, we'll do just contracts, so statement of work and contract. We'll look at a simple contract. We'll also look at a more complex contract. And David Wayne had a comment, um, line item scores for expenses and both firms padded on top list instead of scoring. Okay, let's pull that up. So, you, so you can just cue us up. We can says, read it. Uh, just a comment. Line item quotes are expensive and most firms pad on top of it because of supporting of additional reporting and meeting efforts, which clients also hate. He's saying that consultants are really inefficient and there's all that stuff is really padded obnoxiously. You're padding yourself too, and you're telling your producer, here's your leeway, go do the job. So there's no right or wrong re way I like in which, that answer better in which than you do it. your way is the wrong way. No, I didn't say that your <laughs> you way did, was the wrong on. way. Come on, man. <laughs> so let your, uh, it's all right. Okay. I never uh, said your way is the wrong way. I just said I do it a different so way. So there's different ways of doing it, and there's ways you feel comfortable doing it. But at the end, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, whichever way you do it, it's all about the relationship with the client. If you do not have a good relationship with the client, if you haven't built the rapport and the intimacy that you need with whoever it is that you're working with, it's not even going to matter. Because at the end of the day, do you want to be like, you know, nickel and diming and like dealing with that? You know, no. You want to be getting paid. I, I, you know, my, my, the best clients I've ever had are clients that say, you know what, Jose, you know, we need more work and we're going to pay you because we think you're really worth it and here's how much we have more extra. And they negotiate the whole thing for you. Okay. So that's clients. All right. We're not wrapping up yet. We're running overtime. It's a live We're show. Going overtime. Whatever. Live. There's not another Into program the after question. this. Is there, Jose? And do you have anywhere else to no. go to? No, you do not. There's you no basketball right game after this, so we're staying on. Might be football on these guys. All right, so here we go. Uh, let's pull up the slide, uh, the, the cost consultants, all right? And I'll tell you why I hate doing an hourly bid. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why as soon as the guys are able to pull up that slide. Okay. In, in, if you're working with agencies, there's such a role in the agency called the cost consultant. The cost consultant gets yeah, a true. percentage of whatever they're able to pull out of the bid. I have many problems with this because they're just looking at numbers. Calmly, they're, calmly, they're, they're accountant calmly. types. They go through the numbers Read. and they just pull things out that they don't like arbitrarily. Yeah. And we do know that, at least within our practice, there's a lot of different ways to do a project. You cannot compare one firm's estimate versus another because there are different approaches. Yep. Somebody might do it cell animation, yep. somebody might do 3D hybrid animation or stop motion. And so the end product may or may not look similar, but the process and how you get there is entirely different. So they, they just go through to, to extract numbers from you. The real problem is this, is when you give a fixed bid, it means you're going to deliver the project as promised for that price unless the clients change something, right? So I don't like to talk about how many hours we're going to work on it or even how many people. If I build you the house with the materials and the finishes that you have specified and that we've agreed on based on a drawing that we've approved in the time in which I promise, how I get there is nobody's business. So if I can do it in half the time or if I spend four times the amount, that's my prerogative and I'm not going to ask you for any more money. That's totally fine. Okay. Very valid and an, actual, and an actually very masterful way of doing it. So what's interesting is that one of the things that I ended up doing in my practice was, since I'm already about education and about sharing, yes. is that I made the process so transparent, meaning I put the percentage of the uh, markup in it, I put the hours that we were estimating based on it, and our rates that we were estimated on it. I even have gone as far as putting how much the resource are getting paid. And here's what I've done, and there's more, I've even gone further. By including and teaching the process to the client, as we're going through the process, like the school in line, the clients were like amazed. And, I, and, and actually, I would love to have some of the clients on that went through that process. And this was in the latter part, when I was starting to experiment with the school, and I was running my agency as the school for the client and for the teams. Um, and what was interesting about that is that the people that I did that with, including Veris, actually, Veris experienced a little bit of that, they were so grateful because now they move on forward with the experience on how to do that, especially if it was entrepreneurs. But even in a corporation, some of the people on the other side are going to be a little bit ornery or a little bit, you know, kind of hard-ass with you because they don't know what they're doing. 
Okay. So you might be working for a big agency, and it's a, a producer who this is their second big job or their third big job, and they're going to be fronting, and they're going to be being kind of all like, you know, and you're like going to be uncomfortable negotiating with them. The minute that you have mastery over them, and you know that you're there to protect them and to make sure that they don't fuck up, then you have total control, and you can get whatever price you want. I, I, I don't know. The, it seems like the ratios. I get to say one thing, and Jose gets to say five things. Well, but that's great. I, I, I think that's I awesome. I don't say that I think much. that's awesome. Okay, I'm a little awesome. bit more verbose. You're more verbose. All right. I'm gonna say this part, guys. I like to bid the way I like to see bids. I don't care how anything gets done. I don't even have the time to go through a 12-page document with every single line item. I'm not that kind of guy. And I think the kinds of people I'm working with. Or maybe a little different. No, they're the they're, same they're, as they're, you are, right? No, they're just like me. Yeah. They just want to look at it. Like, can I afford this? Yeah. Are you that guy who's going to yeah. be able to do this? Yeah. No problem. I don't really care. You manage it. And that's a responsibility I carry. And I want to manage it really well. And I, I want to say that. So, like, I've done a couple of bids for uh, building out this space, right? And they supply you with 36 pages of stuff. And it's and you detailed. Just look I just go to the last page. What's the summary? That's what it's going to cost. These are the materials I get approved. Don't come back to me for more money unless I change my mind. Wait, this is the part where I get to say my part, right? So I bid for me. I bid for people that think like me and it works out well. And just like Jose was able to share the story of mastery and people loving him and embracing him, I had the exact same reaction with my clients. Clients are calling me up and saying things like literally, Chris, let's shift this over to a retainer thing. We pay you, we just work. If it feels like too much, ask us for money, more money, right. we'll pay you. Here's a check. Yeah. And, it makes and that's what I said that you want to get to. paperwork easy. You want to get to that. That's where I'm going. Yeah. I have another client saying, you know what, this is amazing. Again, just bill us for whatever. We're going to just give you more stuff to do. We don't even care anymore because I've built up the trust. And they're, they're bottom line guys, meaning what's the price? We're done. Do whatever you but need. But what, what, what I'm going to point out again Please. is simple. Right. You will attract clients that are like you. If oh, right. It, You're it, right. If it's a more complex thing in the digital space and the people have the same mindset that you do and they want to see a correlation between hourly rate and deliverables, and next week what we're going to do is we're going to go over a contract. I'm going to show a contract for a web services project, for a, for a, a digital project, and you can do whatever you want to do. We're going to have a showdown. I'm going to show one of the SWs and contracts and talk about why those are important and how you deal with it. I think that show will predominantly be you. Because I don't have. But, but no, it's you good. You do have. Oh, well, okay. Well, well, that's it. We'll have best in the way that I've seen them. Yeah. They're like POs. They're like, here's a line item for a few things. Oh yeah, yeah, that's it. And it's it. And the that's agency's it. like, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Right. Well, I'll share that. But what I'm trying to say is that that's dangerous in these large projects in these large consulting engagements. And if, and if you want to shift away from being more of a strategic partner, the contracts are going to become more like a consultancy and less like a production firm. Fair enough. That's what I'm saying. Okay, that's next week's episode. Thanks for tuning in and watching School Live. And we really appreciate people who... Good show. ...who've uh, commented. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks Sweet very much. The Tweet rocks. us at The School Rocks. Oh, shoot, and I didn't even check our feed. Uh, hashtag The School Live, but you can actually just hashtag School Live. It's too many words. I like that. All right, guys. One. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you guys next week. See you guys next week. Bye.